everybody. This is Jackie here again with the Sexy Politico. Today I'm here with Ariel Martone. She is a doctor of physical therapy. She is a neuroclinical specialist, yoga teacher, certified pre and postnatal coach, and she's also a mom as well. And we're here today to talk about prenatal, postnatal care, and how basically social media has made me more anxious than I already am. <laughs> so uh, Ariel, can you ta tell my audience a little bit more about you and uh, that I'm not crazy for being more anxious after having my kids? Yeah, absolutely, Jackie. So first and foremost, you are not crazy and you are not alone. Far, far from it. Um, it often feels that way. Uh, I feel like postpartum is a very isolating time period. Even if you are seeking out support, it can still feel really lonely. Um, if you are you know, still connecting with friends and family, I feel like if people aren't in that exact state at that time, we forget very quickly. Um, so if you're not in it day to day, it's, it's easy to not relate and um, that can make you feel more alone and isolated. So you are, you're far from crazy, far from alone. Uh, and that's kind of why I am doing what I'm doing. I too had a really challenging postpartum period with my second. Um, so I'm a, a mom of two, as you mentioned. Um, my son, I had, you know, what would be probably considered like the normal baby blues. Um, but for me, it did, it lasted for about three months of just really kind of self-doubting myself, having, um, you know, just being really insecure in my role as a mother and what I was doing. Um, I had a hard time having him. So I went through IVF. We then had to have an induction, an emergency C-section after like hours of labor and pushing. So like nothing went right or as planned. Um, and then because of that, I just was like, well, was I supposed to be a mom? Like nothing happened naturally. Um, but I, I would say I moved through that rel you know, relatively quickly uh, or so, so I thought. I think a lot of that I kind of just ended up pushing away and didn't deal with or address at the time. Um, and so with my daughter, my second, um, everything went a little smoother. I still had to do IVF, but I was able to have a VBAC, which I really wanted. Um, so our birthing process was, I'm going to put in quotes, better. Um, it, it was yeah. my I, more ideal, um, you know, hindsight, looking back at my son, it was what needed to happen. And so, you know, I'm grateful that, that it was able to happen. Um, and she latched on right away. So our breastfeeding journey was, was seamless. Um, so all things seemed to line up yet with her, I ended up getting postpartum depression, um, I also had a lot of physical symptoms uh, with her. I had some pelvic pain um, that I needed to address as well. And they kind of, you know, compiled on each other as well as like everything from your past gets really resurfaced during the postpartum period. You know, you're triggered more easily because your, you know, your emotions are just more raw. Oh, surface. Our, yeah. Our brain actually changes in the postpartum period, our amygdala becomes enlarged, and that really makes you more prone to being in um, like a hyper alert state. So kind of that more anxious state, you're, you're just more aware of what could go wrong. Um, and so there's, there's so many reasons why we feel the way that we do in postpartum. Um, but with her, I was surprised that I ended up having, you know, clinical postpartum depression. Um, because like I said, everything was, it seemed like it was a little bit smoother going into it. Um, so because of that, and because of needing to seek out the physical care, the emotional care, and feeling really, really isolated, really triggered, I also had postpartum rage with the postpartum depression. Um, so oh I feel like God. that- <laughs> Nobody that anger... talks about postpartum rage. Nobody, yes. they're like, oh yeah, postpartum <laughs> depression exists, but nobody talks about rage. The, the, yeah, how easy it is to snap. Very, yeah, it's very easy. Um, the you know the simplest things can can set you off. Um, you're you're again, like, for, then for three year old reasons. asking for a cookie four times yeah. like 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 it bubbles at you and you just start yelling at them for asking for a cookie and it's like 
I and then know. there's it's your not, spouse going. Not... He can't reach the cookies. He needs a grown up to get the cookies. <laughs> like then you get the cookies for him. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my husband was uh, for sure the target of most of my postpartum rage. Um, but unfortunately, my toddler got yelled at more than I would have liked him to initially as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely not talked about and it, but it is common. Um, you know, we are whole people with the full range of emotions. And I feel like once we become a mother, we're expected to kind of turn that off. Um, and it's, you know, it's looked down upon you. Moms are supposed to be just very nurturing and maternal and sure. Yes, that, but also, you know, you're, you're still a whole person. You're going to get angry. Um, you know, especially when, you know, your, your needs are not maybe being met like they should be. Um, but yeah, having that rage and some of that anger, I ended up turning into, a, you know, more passion for what I'm doing now, because I was angry that I didn't feel, you know, in, in hindsight, I, you know, I had some support, you know, and I, I knew where to look for support, but it still, it wasn't easy. Um, so I decided to take that and, you know, take my experiences and my, you know, professional roles and turn it into postpartum wellness, um, you know, wellness for the whole person, mind and body, because it's so interconnected always, but especially in postpartum, because everything changes, you know, our, our roles change. So how society sees us changes, our bodies physically change, and they take longer to get back to quote unquote, what our body was before, you know, if ever, um, than what we expect. And our, our brains change, our hormones are changed, like everything changes. Um, so unless we're dealing with all of that and addressing all of that and making space for all of that, we can get stuck in certain places. And whether that's getting stuck in some of the anxiety or depression or the, the periods of rage and outbursts of, you know, being triggered by our toddlers. Toddlers are really, really great at bringing up all of your, um, you know, your past triggers or your self doubts. They test every limit. Um, but unless we're taking care of ourselves, it's going to be harder. I'm sorry, it will be easier to snap at them and harder to give them the space that they need. Uh, and I found for myself personally, like the way that I was talking to myself reflected onto my kids and, and, you know, not my baby at the moment, but more so my toddler at the time. Mm -hmm. And I, that's when I, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> I noticed, I noticed my toddler apologizing for like things that you're sitting there going you don't need to be apologizing that you knocked over your own blocks. Yeah. And then like, I'm doing something here. He's apologizing for knocking over his own blocks or dropping a marker on the ground. Yeah. I need to deal with me. Yeah. He it, thinks it, I'm going to be mad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And that, for me, that was one of the, the moments, um, I had spilt milk when I was getting him, you know, getting my son some and my inner dialogue was so mean. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I shouldn't be, you know, it was with expletives, like, how could you do this? You know, oh God, you made such a mess. And this is to myself, but then you, re you know, you realize that what you say to yourself is often how you talk to your kids and you chances are you don't want to talk to your kids like that. And you definitely don't want to talk to yourself like that. Um, but it's, it's really hard in that postpartum period when you're just so emotionally drained, physically drained. Um, if you're not making time and starting to, you know, awareness is kind of the, the key and identifying like that's, you know, the first step uh, in my process is really identifying what's going on. So what are your triggers? What's, how is your body feeling? Um, and, you know, noticing that first, because from there, once you have awareness, once you understand what's going on, then you can make changes. And by no means is this, you know, about being perfect or being a perfectionist. In, in fact, it's very much the opposite. The more I tried to be a perfect mother, I was reading everything on how to, 
you know, raise my child again in quotes correctly and how to best support their, their sleep and just all of the things. And the more that I dove into all of that, the more I, it know, makes you feel like crap, like a failure. Yeah. yeah. The more I was like, I'm never going to live up to this ever. Uh, and so the more that I kind of gave up on that, you know, I, there's definitely been some nuggets that I've learned. I don't want to dismiss all of the information out there as bad. I do think that there is a lot of bad information out there and misinformation, especially around sleep. Um, but the more that I kind of got to know myself again and got to take care of myself, trust myself more, trust my instincts a little bit more, the easier it became. And again, no, by no means perfect. I still, you know, I think I've come a long way. I still yell from time to time, but I re I'm realizing it sooner. I'm able to then change it sooner and you can always, always repair. So then, you know, I'll give myself a moment. I'm more conscious and able to step away, give myself that, that room to breathe, do what I need to do, and then come back and model it to my kids. And, you know, my daughter is 18 months now, so she's able to pick up on on this as well. And, you know, you model that repair, you mo model, like, I was really frustrated because of these reasons. That's no, you know, doesn't make it okay how I acted, but this is what's going on. This is what I'm going to try to do next time. And you just, you know, we, you just treat your kids like people, you know, yeah, and you just, that it's okay to apologize to your kids. Yeah. Nothing think that's wrong like with apologizing biggest. to your kids. No, but so do you think that, you know, there's this, I don't know, we have wine mom culture. And then back in the fifties and sixties, you had like moms on Prozac. I wonder mm. if it's like we replaced Prozac with wine as opposed to, <sighs> as a way to just numb and just numb yourself and just be able to do the job and try not to complain because Hey, at least you got your big old bottle of Merlot or Chardonnay or whatever your drink of choice is. Yeah. I, so I feel like, and we, we spoke about this a little bit before we started recording about, you know, what we see online and in social media. And I feel like there's, there's almost these two narratives out there. And the one is that perfect mom, everything's going, you know, you need to be this way and you need to be that 100% attached parent. And your kids are always doing these quiet activities yeah. that you've planned and set up for them. And, you know, everything is wonderful and your house is always clean. Your kitchen looks great. And you're just like so happy and so just overjoyed all the time. And then there's this other narrative that is quite the opposite, which is more of that, you know, mom wine culture of like, everything is a shit show and everything is a disaster. My kids are wild. And I mean, I say my kids are wild, but I, I say it with, I love that they're wild. I think kids are supposed to be wild. Um, but that like, they're annoying or overwhelming. And the only way to get through it is with some type of, you know, numbing out. Um, and I think there's so much in between, like so much in between. Uh, and you're going to have, you know, you're going to have both days and then that's okay. And to, you know, to not put yourself in a box or to, you know, feel like you need to define yourself as like one type of mom or another. I feel like we are so prone to labeling ourselves oh in our society and defining gosh. ourselves in particular ways, whether it's by what you crunchy do. Crunchy mom. Mm -hmm. You've got the crunchy mom, the, the Fisher Price mom, the beige mom. What, yeah. what else have I seen? Oh God. I've seen a yeah. few others, but those are the ones that just stick out to my head. And I'm just sitting there going, I guess I'm a Fisher Price. Oh, and then of course there's wine <laughs> Do mom. Do I have to pick? Wine yeah. mom, boy mom. Yeah. Apparently now boy mom is a bad thing because it, <laughs> because it, if you have if you say I'm a boy mom, that means you're gonna be like that really weird mother-in-law that thinks that you're that whoever your son's married is never going to be good enough and I'm like I'm a boy mom because I'm a mom of because I boys. have boys <laughs> I have two boys and no girls and I'm not planning on having more kids yeah so wouldn't no, that just I make know. me a boy mom by default <laughs> yes 
uh, I th <laughs> I've seen, I think it's more like when they're like, oh, this is the slowest breakup of your life type of thing where, the, where that oh, might I get into that. crazy and it's like <laughs> That might get into crazy mother-in-law territory in the future, but I don't know. <laughs> I guess no, we but, we'll find out. <laughs> but I feel like when we, when we as, when people who have, when people have children, they see social media, which is supposed to be real people going through parenting. And of course we always forget that you only show the high, highlight reel. And then you see mm -hmm. celebrities who are like two months after having a baby, they look, they look just like themselves. And I, and I'm just like, how are we supposed to, why do we feel like we need to compare ourselves to people that either are very good at editing or hire people to take care of their physical bodies and may or may not have other mental issues going on that we don't know about. Yeah. I know. Because you look at celebrity bounce back culture, they pay good money for people to help them get their bodies back in shape, but we don't know what's going on behind the, behind the brain. Yeah. And you have, you have to always, you have to always think again about the whole person and then at what cost? Like, can you get your body back? Sure, to a point, but at what cost? And are you doing it in a way that is, that is going to be sustainable for you as a whole person? Um, you know, cause look at how you get your body back. There's, you know, sure, several ways and people either do it by kind of crash dieting right after um, which is going to lead to, if you're trying to breastfeed, it's going to make it really challenging to support your supply because you need, you my know, mother was forced to crash diet after having my sister. Cause she was in the military at the time. Uh, and of course that lifestyle would never have in 1983 supported her breastfeeding at all. So she was just no. convinced she couldn't breastfeed, but she had to lose like 60 pounds in 30 days. Yeah. That's, that seems almost impossible. Like I can't even pills. imagine the stress. She told um, me it was, she told me she took diet pills and didn't yeah. eat anything basically. Yeah. And so then how does that affect your, your mental health? Um, you know, and as, as you mentioned it, she wasn't able to breastfeed then because of it. And if that was something that she wanted, I know the eighties was a different time where they were still very much promoting, um, you know, formula first. Um, and people who did breastfeed, it was usually a very short amount of time um, that they did. But yeah, if you're if you're crash dieting like that, you're likely not going to be able to breastfeed if that's something that you want to do. But also, like if that's not what you want to do, it's still going to affect you. Your body's still recovering and healing, and your body needs more calories for that. Your hormones are changing and fluctuating, and if you are crash dieting and not supporting your hormones, you're they're going to be way off um, and you can end up having more issues that way. And, you know, just, you're going to feel more exhausted at a time where you're already likely feeling exhausted. Um, so it really compounds a lot of negative effects. And when, you know, then when you're more exhausted, you're going to, you're likely going to be more anxious or more depressed. You know, if you're, if you're feeling either of those things, when you're, fatigued and tired, it makes that worse. Um, so yeah, it's, it's less than ideal in my, in my opinion, it's less than well, ideal. It's, it wasn't <laughs> ideal, but it was, it, it was what she had to deal with in 1983. And think, I mean, at that point she said she got one month off after having my sister and it's not much better now. They get six weeks off after having a baby. It, if you are a woman in the military, it's okay. And I'm sitting there going, it's 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 like those Oklahoma Senate male Oklahoma senators who are calling maternity leave a vacation. And I'm just sitting there going, I would yeah. like you to either have a child ripped out of your stomach or ripped out of your other parts and call it a vacation while that those parts of your body are healing yeah I You're so bleeding. I remember because even have people don't even realize after having I had two c-sections and it's like after having c-sections you're still in pain you're still bleeding you're 
and you're dealing that's major surgery it's not yeah that's it's what not, I it is a major surgery it's major surgery you're that. not taking the easy way out I had my my oldest it was an emergency c-section after being induced and I nearly died because I didn't have my OB in there because one month before I was supposed to give birth, I had to switch hospitals. Yay. And my OB did not have admitting privileges at the new hospital I could go to, but he had to just stand there and watch. I loved my OB with my older son, by the way. And he was like, he kept telling the doctor who had privileges, you should do this. You should do this. You should check on this. And they're like, oh no, it's fine. You're 20 years younger than me. And I nearly died because they didn't listen to my OB. Yeah, that is, that is so tough. It is, yeah, having a C-section absolutely is a major surgery that people seem to kind of gloss over. And yes, they, they think that it is having the easy way out. There can be a lot of guilt and shame around it. I, I had I a lot of guilt initially. and shame around having mm-hmm. a C-section with my oldest son because I, I, I wanted... I wanted the, you know, the fairy tales and roses of pushing him out and be feeling like a real mom. Like I was crying to my husband, like, I'm not a real mom. I didn't push him out. He's like, he's like, four letter word that (laughs) you nearly died giving birth to our son. If that doesn't make you a mother, then I don't know what else does. (laughs) No, but it, it, so it, it stems from what our expectations are, our expectations around our, you know, our birth plan. Uh, I think everyone should have a birth plan, but I think you need to go into it knowing that it's more of like gentle guidelines than, than how it's going to be. And, and being flexible with that is the best thing that you can do for yourself. It's still, you know, I was fairly flexible with mine and I also I really loved my OB. This, but... <laughs> um, so I trusted her when, when we got to that point of like, okay, this is, <laughs> we're, we're going to have to have the C-section. I did really trust her and I knew I was in good hands. It didn't make the decision any easier. Yeah. FMLA, I hate it. My, so I, I'm a stay at home mom with my kids and with my eldest, he was born, my husband works as a contractor for a school company for, for a, for the schools. And so as my eldest, he was, he was born in the summertime. So my husband was home for a couple of months with, with him before he had to go back to work. But with my, with my baby, he was born three weeks early in, in December. Mm. So my husband was having to take meetings in the hospital. (laughs) My husband like literally I you know after having a c-section you can't drive and I'm supposed to be taking my son to these you know these doctor's appointments and I'm like hold on (laughs) how do how am I supposed to do this and at that point at that point so I had like I had like a plan that my son decided to come three weeks early and mess up the plan my sister was going to come but my sister doesn't drive. So my dad was, so like she had plane tickets and it was like, we had a plan. Yes. <laughs> best best laid babies plans. Don't plans to, babies don't listen to plans. They do not. No. But, nope. And they that don't. Was, like, it was, it was bad because I'm like, what am I supposed to do? And my husband, my husband had to work. <laughs> Yeah, my so when I had my C-section as well, um, I ended up I had a lot of blood loss, um, and they kept me in like the full. I think it was five days that I was at the hospital, but one of the days, I think it was like the second or the third day, my husband had to leave to go into work for a bunch. Forget what exactly it was if it was meetings or he had already had. Um, he he's a veterinary surgeon, so if he already had uh, surgery scheduled, because again. My son at that point, he went, was a week late and I had to be induced at 41 weeks. So again, best laid plans because he had taken off a few days prior, but he didn't, you know, he didn't take off a full like two or three weeks or anything like that. I think he took off a week around the the due date time. Um, So yeah, so I was just in the hospital by myself, which was fine because in the hospital you have their support you have there, nurses but I was like, and other helpers. Yeah, and yeah. Like but that. I was like, oh, really? <laughs> what? Um, but yeah, I, 
same. You're not technically supposed to drive, especially if you're on any any pain meds. Um, I ended up only um, really needing to be on Tylenol after the C-section. I had a really pretty good recovery from mine. I was I was lucky. Um, but again, I I loved my OB, and I think she did a phenomenal job um, with the with the surgery and the procedure. And I think that that helped with my recovery. Um, and I also, being a physical therapist, I knew what to do because as we said before, a C-section is a major, major abdominal surgery and you don't receive any PT aftercare in the hospital, which I'm as a PT myself, I'm like, wait a second. I did some time in acute care, you know, which is working in a hospital and pretty much any surgery that anyone has just about you go in and you see them and you make sure they're getting up. Okay. But that, you know, that doesn't happen on the maternity ward. Yeah. There's, you know, there's nurses there to help you get to the bathroom if you need it. Um, but other than that there, you don't have that person coming in being like, okay, so this is how you should get out of bed. Um, this is how you should brace your incision so that you're more comfortable and can move more e easily. And you should try to be walking around a couple times, you know, a day to get blood flowing to help with with the recovery process. You don't have any of that, um, which is kind of shocking. Um, but I, and I feel like because I knew what to do, it did help my recovery. Um, but then I, you know, took myself to doctor's appointments that me for my son that maybe I shouldn't have been doing on my own at that time. I was just like um, having to again as mom, you I have to do it. Home. Yeah, I was having to call my mother-in-law, who was the only person I knew who had had C-sections, and was like, is it normal for it to be itchy? And she's like, remember yeah. I had my kids 30 years ago, but it's still itchy to me. It's still itchy sometimes for me. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, okay, so it's not weird. And then I'm like, I'm like, like even to this day, I'm sitting here going, they probably should see a physical therapist for for my core muscles like I feel like I still feel like nobody tells you that like how your muscles like your stomach muscles and your back muscles just feel shot after having after having c-sec I probably kids in general but I don't know about having vaginal deliveries I just know about me and my c-sections yeah. So, and well, your pelvic floor, the muscles change as well, regardless of if you've had a vaginal birth or a C-section um, birth, because you're carrying your baby for nine months and, you know, the first few months, there's not a ton of extra weight and right. pressure on it. But as your baby grows and as your pelvis shifts, because, you know, with our hormones, the relaxing kind of loosens up the ligaments. It allows our pelvis to expand, to get wider, to make room for the baby. But so our pelvis, our, our bones are separating a little bit more than what they were that changes the the length tension relationship of the muscles and then they're they're having to support all this extra pressure of the baby and the placenta the water weight all of that so they're doing more work at this stretched out length um so I have regardless of babies. if you have I have giant uh, babies my kids were both what my eldest was nine pounds born at 41 weeks and my youngest was eight pounds born at 37 weeks you're like I'm glad you came a little early <laughs> I literally went to my doctor's appointment and they're like do you realize you're contracting five minutes apart right now I'm like <laughs> no <laughs> yeah no. I just thought I was running out of breath because I have a giant baby <laughs> No. Yeah. So yeah. So all that pressure on those muscles, again, whether you are pushing your baby out, because it's not the pelvic floor muscles that are doing the pushing. It's, it's your uterus itself. That's, that's pushing the baby out. The, the muscles are supposed to be relaxing to let the baby pass through, but they need to recover. They need to kind of regain their proper length tension relationship. And they're going to need to do um, some strengthening, but often before that they're going to need to be um you know work on the on the tension and the tightness of the muscles because afterwards they tend to get really tight again regardless of if you've had a 
uh, vaginal delivery or uh, cesarean delivery. Um, but yeah, so ap absolutely. And then there's, you know, if you've had the C-section, there's scarring that occurs and the degree of scarring can vary. Um, so doing like scar massage or even, as you mentioned, like the area being itchy. So itchy is, is really normal whenever tissue is healing. Um, incisions tend to get itchy and you want to avoid scratching as much as you can. So like gently, gently rubbing the area around it, but not scratching over the incision, um, which can feel really hard because it's really can be really irritating. Um, but then afterwards, so as the incision starts to heal and is fully closed, you want to start doing some scar massage to the area. And with a C-section, you can usually start between six and eight weeks that um, superficial incision over, you know, what you're seeing is usually pretty much healed. Um, so you can start doing gentle scar massage there, but you do want to wait to do like deeper scar massage, which just really means a lot more pressure um, because there, you know, you've had multiple five layers. layers I, of, think it, yeah. it is, I think it's five layers when I, when I was told. Yeah. Yep, because there, there's the, you know, the skin layer, there's, you know, going through all the muscles and there's going through the uterus itself. So all of that, that you know, there's incision throughout the whole, the whole thing. Um, and that all needs to heal. But those are all areas that scar tissue can develop. Um, so if you want it, you want to wait to closer to like 10 to 12 weeks to do a lot deeper scar massage just to affect the deeper layers. Um, but that can help with symptoms that you might be experiencing later on. Um, I feel like a lot of a lot of our like women's health issues that happen after childbirth are very much kind of like normalized and that becomes part of the expectation um, of like, oh, you might just you're gonna feel weaker and you're but it can it can also be son. yeah that's what I was gonna say like you could you may leak when you're laughing or sneezing or God forbid you're jumping on a trampoline with your kids like you're gonna pee your pants like no that doesn't have to be your story like that's it's very common but it's not normal and if you actually you know seek out the support that you need and and really rehabilitate and allow your body to heal and then recover because we have to heal first as we're recovering right we can't just jump into and like going into the bounce back culture you know if you're not dieting you're often you might be jumping into exercise too soon or uh, not the right exercises too soon um you know for me I'm I'm a runner and I I love it it's a big part of my like mental clarity and sanity and I can do it with my kids which is great but you need to wait at least 12 weeks and a lot of times people will try to start doing it sooner than later and you know well I mean sometimes if your doctor's telling you you can you can you can have intercourse at six weeks why can't you go for a run if you can have intercourse at six weeks right well you're usually you're usually given the go ahead you're cleared for everything at six weeks which really is more like if you've had any incisions, they're looking at that. And same if you've had a vaginal delivery and you've had any tearing or um, or if they did like an episiotomy on purpose, making sure that that's healed, making sure your uterus is, is close to being back to its normal size. That usually takes about six weeks for your uterus to shrink down. And then once your uterus is back to its normal size, typically the, um, the wound from your placenta should be healed at that point too. And, you know, there's more evidence now that that might be healed sooner than the six week point, <laughs> but don't, but don't, don't jump start. into anything earlier because of it, um, because there's still so much going on and your, you know, all of your organs shift as your baby grows. So just because your placenta, I'm sorry, just because your uterus has shrunk back down to its normal size, doesn't mean that all of your Not organs like all are of a sudden shifted your lungs back into your stomach are going to drop. <laughs> Yeah, that can, that can take longer. That can take up to 12 weeks for everything to kind of reshift back to where it was. Um, so really anywhere between the six and 12 week mark is when that happens. And a lot of women have separation of their abdominal muscles early on. And that can take about 12 weeks to start to close up. If it's going to happen on its own, it doesn't always happen on its own though. And then you might need to start doing you know, more work to address that as well, because as you mentioned before, you know, 
your back muscles, your abdominal muscles, it's, that's all connected and it's all connected to your pelvic floor. And that's really your core and your foundation to support all of your movement, um, for everything that you're doing. Yeah. I mean, eventually I did get my sister to come. We figured out the flights and got my sister down a couple of days after I gave birth to my son, but it was like, if I didn't have her, I had a three-year-old who, you know, is still a human being who wants to be cuddled and is confused by this new human that is in his house. Yeah. It's like, and you're told not to lift anything larger than 10 pounds. And my son grew so fast after he was born. He was, he was close to 10 pounds at two months old. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're not supposed to lift anything over 10 pounds, but also, but you also got this 30 pound toddler as well. Who is like, who you're like, I can't lift you. Yeah. Bull hunky. Yeah. Well, yeah. Toddler aside, yeah. Put your baby in the baby carrier and that's likely over 10 pounds, but you're expected to lug that out to all of your baby visits. Oh yeah. 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 Very early on. So it's everything feels very contradictory. And I think this is why, why being a mom is so confusing and you feel like you don't especially in this day and age where we are being where we are constantly being fed information about all of our all of our with abortion rights and everything else and you feel like your body isn't really yours when you don't know how to take care of it nobody tells you how to take care of your reproductive health because that's gross or scary or you think that it's going to turn women into sexual creatures too early on or things of that nature and I just I wish that we are that we were told the truth that we need time to recover that we need paternity and maternity leave because if you have a wife who's a stay-at-home mother somebody needs to help take care of the kids yeah especially if she gives if she gives birth and you are the breadwinner but who's going to take care of the kids while she's recovering for even even six weeks is there a magic fairy we don't live in a world anymore where you have where you have a village to help you no and honestly we haven't lived in that world in a while and not and we haven't caught up you know we have to as as women and as mothers we have to create our own villages which it is, you know, at this point, it is what it is, but it's, it's not fair, (laughs) but you need to start seeking out your support and your care because we, we don't live in that world where, where we have all this external support at our fingertips and, and ready to care for the mother and care for the child. And I feel like until we really start caring for the mother in postpartum, we really can't care for the child as well as we could or as well as we should um because you know our mental health and our physical health are you know our just our well-being in general is reflected onto our babies their their nervous systems their brains are still very much developing and they gain a lot of that from us they start to you know regulate their bodies even even their body temperature from us initially um you know placing placing your baby on your chest that skin to skin time has so many benefits and one of them is helping to regulate the body temperature because since our breasts are highly vascularized they can change temperatures by a couple of degrees to help the baby adjust so if the baby is a little bit warm we will start to cool down at our chest area to help take that heat from the baby and vice versa if baby's a little bit cool We'll, you know, blood flow will increase the area, warm up our chest area to help warm the baby up. Um, so, you know, we are so connected to our babies early on and in a culture and society that's very much like push for independence right away and push for baby to be sleeping right away for very, you know, by themselves. It It's kind of counterintuitive to what's actually happening and same to your point of, you know, the, the physical and emotional healing that not, that needs to happen postpartum. It, we have this push to bounce back, whether it's bouncing your body back, bouncing back into your roles, whether it's getting right back into work, it, 
at four to six weeks that, you know, is what some moms take and some, you know, there are some who take less. I know it's insane. I can't, I can't imagine the thought of it. You're still me bleeding anxiety. and having to go back <laughs> to work. I, I think I was bleeding for almost a month after having, after having my kids. Yeah. With me, it was, I was eight weeks uh, after my daughter and I think it was right around the six weeks after my son um but yeah it's it's a long time yeah and that's because you know your your body's feeling through all that time section I I, like there were people who didn't believe me that that you bled after having a c-section yeah yeah our body still you know we still have to do that and you know regardless of how the baby comes out the placenta is still detached and you know that blood needs to go somewhere so yeah, you don't want it to stay. No, you, no, you do not. No, but what would, how could we in American society help women, help women more postpartum as just as friends? Because that's really all we can do as friends and then maybe as family who have time and space. Yeah, so I think it's a great question because you know, we've we've touched on it before. I feel like we need bigger changes, but those changes start with us first. Um, and so absolutely supporting your friend who's just had a baby. A great thing, I think, is bringing over a meal, something that you know that they're going to like without even asking. Like, don't ask. Don't ask, what can I do for you? Because that mom is already two things. That mom is already overwhelmed and doesn't want to have to think about making another decision. And also that mom doesn't want to ask for help because she doesn't want to admit that she needs it. And she does. And it's okay to need help. It's more than okay to need help because we weren't meant to do it alone. We were meant to have that support and that village and allow for that time for nurturing and for healing. Um, So don't ask what you can do. Just pop over with a meal. Don't plan on staying yourself. Um, Something that's frozen is, is great. I think that is, you know, one of the biggest things for me, that was always the hardest thing early on too, is, you know, going back to, you want to feel nourished. You want to have that warm meal cooking for yourself, especially if you're home by yourself and you have your baby or multiple children and and your partner is either at work or you don't have one. It can be really daunting to make meals for yourself early on um, or, or for your family. Um, so I feel like that's always a really good and easy thing to do. Um, there's also a bunch of companies that you can send, you know, prepackaged frozen meals. You can mail them to, to that person if you don't live nearby. Um, if you do live nearby coming over and just, you know, say, Hey, I, you know, I'm here for the laundry or I'm here to straighten up or, or, I'm going to take your other kid out for ice cream or whatever, just something. And just, just say what you're going to do and then do it. Because again, that, that, and of course it's going to depend on your relationship with the person. Well, yeah, right? I'm not going to let, yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm not I'm going to let someone pop who's it over your neighbor's if, house that you like met once or twice and be like, Hey, I'm, I'm going, going to take, take your, your kid, kid out. <laughs> <laughs> but if you have, if you have a good relationship with that person, just, you know, doing those little gestures can be really helpful because it, it gives permission to ask for support without having to ask. And then as you get more accustomed, as a mother, as you get more accustomed to having some support, hopefully you're more likely to start asking for what you need as well, which I think is really helpful, um, but can be a process. Is there anything that we could do legislatively or that we should, we should advocate for legislatively to help mothers in any way shape or form oh this is a good question and I I wish I had a better answer I think you know working on maternity and paternity uh, is is number one real like absolutely what I would think of a bare minimum I think everybody needs three months oh my gosh that would be huge bare minimum and I think but I think we need to do it in a way that that makes sense like clearly just saying that the mom needs more support and needs more time to heal is not 
getting anybody's attention, right? Like that sounds great. It is true. It is needed. But also like when a mom has that time to one bond with her baby, to take care of herself so she can bond with her baby, to figure out is she experiencing postpartum depression or anxiety? Because it doesn't necessarily happen within those first three to six weeks. It can happen, you know, really up until that that whole first year, you can start yeah. to get um, symptoms of it or, or diagnosed with it. It's not necessarily a right away thing. And does that bouncing back contribute to it? I think that that would be a great place for more research. In, in my opinion, I feel like that is part of it. Um, but, you know, so, so pushing for it in a way that, you know, once you are able to take care of yourself, and you're able to trust yourself and you're able to make your decisions more confidently and go into it without all the self-doubt and the mom guilt and all of that. When you do go back into the workforce, you're likely going to be more productive because you're more focused and you're more confident in your decisions and in your choices. So you're able to actually be there doing what you need to do, uh, which is only gonna have benefits for the co those companies. Uh, and then when you're home, you're gonna, again, be, be able to be, more present. Um, so I, I feel like we need better research first. So that way, when we go to push for the legislation, we can, we can be like, these are like the real reasons why, because I feel like there are tremendous benefits to better maternity, you know, maternity care and support that will ultimately. So as a physical therapist, I am a huge proponent of prevention. And, you know, I feel like this is a fight that physical therapists are constantly on is like prevention is key in so many areas and, and doing like the least invasive work first, like not jumping to surgery right away, because a lot of times outcomes can be better and eventually save money. And so if you want to bring it back to that money piece, because then people will listen, um, you know, think about the money that you're going to be saving later on, because all of these other issues aren't going to necessarily resurface. Um, when we are actually able to have the care that we need. Um, so I, I feel like it starts with having more research and more funding to support research for better maternal care and better maternal health to then go back and push for things like longer um, maternity leave and better support that way. Well, part of the problem in this country as opposed to other countries is and we're speaking from the United States, is that our maternity care is paid for by the companies that we work for as opposed to mm -hmm. the federal government. And that is the big problem, that companies don't want to pay out, shill out that money for maternity leave. And so the federal government really needs to be coming in and stepping in. What do you think is the is the one thing that every, that every woman or person birthing person needs to hear right after they give birth and they are just in that post baby cloud what do they need to hear uh, I I feel like there are so many things that they need to hear I feel like the first thing is you are not alone in in what you are feeling what you are feeling is real and valid whatever it might be whether it's you know feeling a little bit disconnected from your baby or from yourself um, that that those feelings are valid and they are real and you are not alone in that. And that if you need support, it is more than okay to seek support and to seek help in whichever way that is possible for you, whether it's reaching out to your community or, you know, asking for your partner for, for some more help. If it's, you know, looking into and getting physical therapy, getting counseling, getting coaching, whatever you are able to obtain for yourself. Uh, and of course, that's going to vary on, you know, on your resources, both community support wise and both financially, um, but seeking the support that you are able to gather for yourself uh, in whatever way that you can. Is there anything that you need, you would like to share with our audience? Do you have any, do you have a website or any place that people could go to, to learn, learn more or speak with you or connect with you? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you can find me on Instagram at Ariel Martone, which is my name there. Um, I also have my website is www.findyourwaymama.com. Um, and 
on there on my website, I have information about my eight week coaching program, which is the postpartum revolution to really kind of blend the healing that's needed both physically, emotionally, mentally to get you into a better state. Um, and, um, because I feel really passionate about helping mothers, you know, worldwide, um, offering you the support that you get, but also, you know, 10% of proceeds are going to be going to um, organizations to help mothers around the world. That's, that's amazing. Well, thank you very much for being on the Sexy Politico. And I look thank forward you for to having me. And I look forward to uh, speaking to you all next again next week. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>